In some of my previous videos, I've spoken about how our body processes macronutrients such as fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, or how our body needs and processes micronutrients such as vitamins and minerals. In this video, we'll talk about how our body metabolizes something that a lot of people consume but doesn't really count as a source of nutrition, alcohol. In this video, we're talking about how our body detoxifies alcohol and the consequences of drinking too much, as well as the potential benefits there are in consuming alcohol in moderation. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to be talking about alcohol. Now, technically speaking, alcohol is a term to describe a broad class of chemicals with similar structural formulas. But since we're talking about nutrition and human beings and not just about chemistry, what we're mainly focusing on is a single type of alcohol known as ethanol. Ethanol is a type of alcohol that is consumed in alcoholic beverages and has been consumed by, for thousands of years by many different cultures uh, for celebratory, religious, and medicinal purposes. Now, alcohol has been known to have beneficial effects um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of one health, uh, both mentally and physically, but we also know that consuming alcohol in excess has multiple uh, negative consequences for one's health and can potentially be fatal. In this video, we're going to talk about how our body processes alcohol and removes it from the body and essentially detoxifies it so it doesn't poison us and kill us. But we'll also talk about the consequences of overconsumption of alcohol, particularly in the long term. Now, in terms of what we consider to be abuse of alcohol or excessive alcohol consumption, the standard guidelines for alcohol consumption are that a woman should consume no more than a single alcoholic beverage in a 24 hour period and a man should consume no more than two alcoholic beverages in a 24 hour period. Those are the set nutritional guidelines. And though there are def definite definitions um, about what constitutes alcoholism and binge drinking, for the purposes of this, we're gonna refer to anything as excessive consumption that exceeds those daily recommended amounts uh, of alcohol. Now, alcohol is considered to be a psychoactive drug, and the reason why is that alcohol readily absorbs into your system and can cross the blood-brain barrier and impact the way your brain behaves. It can impact uh, things such as speech patterns, it can impact memory, and it can also impact uh, how we actually behave in social situations. About 90% of the alcohol we consume is going to be, uh, going to be metabolized uh, and it's going to go and get processed by the liver. We'll talk about that in more detail in just a few minutes. The other 10% is going to hang out in the bloodstream, and that is uh, where it's going to be transported throughout the body, and that's how it's going to uh, make its way across the blood-brain barrier and influence, uh, and influence our behavior via, uh, via our brain. As I said, 90% of the alcohol is, that we consume is going to go to our liver, while the other 10% hangs out in circulation in our bloodstream. That 10% is actually going to be processed by some of the cells that are around there, but the majority of it is excreted actually through our breath, it's excreted through our sweat, and it's excreted uh, through our saliva. And that's how that's gonna be removed from the body. And this is actually how breathalyzers work. So uh, breathalyzers are, a, um, are an official way of determining uh, how intoxicated an individual is. Um, and this is actually done by measuring um, something called the blood alcohol concentration, which is uh, measured in terms of milligrams of alcohol per percent unit of blood. Um, so when we talk about whether somebody is legally drunk, that typically means they have a BAC equal to or greater than 0 0.08, okay? Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that somebody has to have that level, that BAC in order to be exhibiting symptoms of having consumed alcohol. Um, people actually exhibit symptoms of having consumed alcohol at much uh, lower BACs than that. And some people may actually be able to have higher BACs before they begin to exhibit those signs and symptoms. Um, however, legally speaking, 0 0.08 is the point at which somebody is considered to be legally intoxicated, at least according to a breathalyzer. 
However, because the vast majority of alcohol actually um, that is not processed by the liver can be found in the bloodstream, blood tests are actually a more reliable indicator uh, than doing a, uh, doing a breathalyzer. However, um, breathalyzers are significantly less invasive and more timely in terms of how they're able to provide a readout of whether somebody is legally intoxicated or not. Now, as I mentioned before, um, alcohol really isn't considered a source of nutrition. Um, while alcoholic beverages such as wine and beer may contain some nutrition in the form of carbohydrates or sugars, um, overwhelmingly the majority of what's happening when you consume alcohol is quite simply your body detoxifying the ethanol that's contained within that beverage. And because that's what's predominantly happening, that's what we're really going to focus on uh, in this particular video is how does our body actually process uh, the ethanol that we consume. So like I said, about 90% of the alcohol that is ingested is going to have to be processed by the liver. The other 10% or so is either going to be excreted through breath or through sweat or through saliva. Um, and also about 5% of the alcohol you consume is actually going to be processed by cells of the gastrointestinal tract, cells that line your mouth, um, that cells that line your throat, your esophagus, and so on and so forth. So as I said, somewhere around 90% of the alcohol that you consume is going to need to be detoxified by your liver. Uh, the overwhelming majority of that is going to be detoxified by one of two major systems uh, in your body for detoxifying alcohol. The first one, and the one that does the majority of the work, is the alcohol dehydrogenase complex. It's a series of enzymatic steps that help to break down ethanol and turn it into relatively harmless um, compounds that can then be excreted or utilized by your body for other purposes. Um, the, first step, uh, the first step in the process actually converts alcohol into um, an extremely toxic substance known as acetaldehyde. Uh, but that's where the enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase actually comes into play. It takes acetaldehyde and it breaks it down and converts it into a complex known as acetate. And acetate is something that is harmless and can actually be utilized by your body in some cases um, for nutrition or can be excreted as harmless waste. Now, in somebody who is not an excessive drinker, um, the, the other 10 to 15% of alcohol is actually going to be detoxified by another system known as the MEOS. MEOS stands for methanol, Microsomal Ethanol Oxidizing System. So the, the Microsomal Ethanol Oxidizing System, which obviously we shortened to MEOS, um, is, going to cons is going to help to process somewhere between 10 and 15% of all consumed ethanol in the liver uh, in people who are not excessive drinkers. This percentage may actually be significantly higher in people who do consume alcohol to excess, particularly on a regular basis. Just like we saw with the alcohol dehydrogenase system, it's going to convert ethanol into acetaldehyde, which is then going to be rapidly converted into acetate. Essentially, it ends up producing the same byproducts, it just goes about it in different ways. So there are two different ways your body uh, works together in concert to help detoxify itself of of um, of ethanol okay so one of the things that can actually happen though is this acetaldehyde actually um, the step that detoxifies it um, may not be able to keep up so in cases of high levels of, of ethanol ethanol consumption uh, some of this acetaldehyde can actually build up in the liver and in some cases up to 10 percent of that acetaldehyde is actually going to accumulate in, in the hepatocytes the liver cells as a result, some of this acetaldehyde is actually going to spill over. It's going to leave the liver and it's going to go into circulation. And in circulation, it can be incredibly painful. Uh, it can cause things like nausea, vomiting, and it can even affect the brain in such a way that it can cause a person to completely black out and lose consciousness. Um, so this is highly problematic, but this is the effect of that byproduct of alcohol metabolism accumulating in your system. The other thing to consider is that the other 2 to 10% of alcohol that is not being processed by the liver is essentially going to be excreted. As I said, a lot of it's being, some of it's being excreted by your breath, some of it's going to be excreted in your saliva as well as your sweat, but the majority of it is actually going to be cleared by your kidneys. It's going to go to the kidneys and your body is going to excrete it. But here's one of the other problems with that process. Alcohol is essentially a diuretic. The reason why is your body is trying to excrete that, but in excreting it, it's going to produce a significant amount of urine. To produce that urine, it's going to rob your cells of the water that's inside of it. And as a result, all of those frequent trips to the bathroom that commonly occur in people when they're drinking, 
their body is trying to remove the ethanol from its system, but, in, but it's also going to remove significant portions of water from your system. And as a result, dehydration ensues. So a common side effect of drinking too much is to have that morning hangover. And that morning hangover is quite often a result of that dehydration that you experience from consuming too much alcohol. Now, to be fair, there really is no way to sober yourself up or no way to cure a hangover. The best way to treat it would be to consume something that contains electrolytes, things like sports drinks that are going to replace both the water and the electrolytes that you lost through the excessive urination the night before. If you consume too much alcohol and the acetaldehyde aldehyde is made into your bloodstream, you may have also vomited, uh, which is also going to contribute to that feeling of dehydration and the other hangover effects such as headaches, nausea, and all the other associated things that come along with it. Now, of course, there is going to be some amount of pain that's associated with it, but it's very important that when we're planning to consume alcoholic beverages, are consuming alcoholic beverages, or have consumed alcohol beverages, we do not use anything that, can see, that contains the drug acetaminophen to treat that pain. And the main reason why is acetaminophen, just like alcohol, is also cleared by the liver. And the metabolic processes that help to detoxify the acetaminophen in the liver rely on something known as glutathione. Now, glutathione, we haven't talked about yet, but glutathione is a key ingredient that MEOS and the alcohol dehydrogenase systems both employ in order to help convert that harmful glutaraldehyde into acetate. The problem is this, when you drink too much, much of that glutathione is being utilized by your liver cells to detoxify the alcohol. And as a result, there is an accumulation of a harmful metabolite from the acetaminophen. This harmful metabolite has a big, long chemical name, but we abbreviate it as NAPQI. And the problem is, is NAPQI needs glutathione to be detoxified and removed from your body. And without it, uh, with all that glutathione being utilized by the processes to detoxify alcohol, NAPQI begins to accumulate, and this can actually damage and kill liver cells. Now, acutely, it's probably not going to be a major issue. However, if someone has consumed too much alcohol, already has existing liver problems, or regularly consumes a combination of alcohol and acetaminophen, this could actually lead to irreversible liver damage and could prove to be fatal. Now, as I just mentioned, overconsumption of alcohol can lead to a host of problems, nausea, vomiting, headache, dizziness, blurred vision, um, and all of this is the result of uh, the ethanol as well as, in some cases, the acetaldehyde impacting neuronal function in the brain. In the short term, um, Cease, the cessation of, consume, of the alcohol consumption will end up reversing the overwhelming majority of these problems, although it could take several hours or days depending on how much the person is consumed. In the long term, however, recurrent abuse of alcohol can have permanent effects. And the reason why is when that alcohol and that, and, and that acetaldehyde makes it into the brain cells, the brain cells, just like all the other nerve cells in your body and the other cells in your body in general, have to find a way to detoxify that stuff. The problem is, is that the byproducts of that detoxification actually can kill neurons. And over time, the overconsumption of alcohol can lead to permanent neural damage, including damage within the brain, which obviously can have some permanent, long-lasting, and profound side effects. The overconsumption of alcohol can have also important effects on our physiology. When you consume alcohol, one of the things that's going to happen is those adrenal glands that sit at the top of your kidney are going to start releasing a, 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 a hormone called uh, epinephrine, also known as adrenaline. Adrenaline is going to stimulate the release of glucagon from your pancreas. Now remember that glucagon is sort of the opposite of insulin. Insulin says food is plentiful, take it in, uh, store it, and do what you want with it. On the other hand, glucagon is the signal for um, we need to start, you know, blood glucose is low, we need to start breaking down glycogen. Um, so it starts the process of glycogenolysis, which is the conversion of glycogen into glucose by the liver. It also stimulates the, the mobilization of fat stores. So you're gonna start seeing um, triglycerides being mobilized and they're going to begin being cleaved into fatty acids and both of those products, the, the, the glucose as well as the fatty acids are actually going to end up accumulating in the liver. The liver of course is going to reassemble those uh, fatty acids and glycerol head groups into triglycerides. The result of this is actually something called fatty liver disease or hepatic steatosis. Um, this is actually a symptom of somebody who is overconsuming alcohol on a regular basis uh, because the accumulation of this fat is a byproduct of the mobilization of these fat stores. Now, typically, um, 
fatty liver disease, uh, which is, is also known as um, an ALD or an alcoholic liver disease, um, is reversible as long as somebody stops consuming the alcoholic beverages. However, there are two other major uh, ALDs that I wish to discuss with you that are significantly more uh, severe. So fatty liver disease can typically clear up on its own, and not everybody that overconsumes alcohol ends up with fatty liver disease. However, over time, some people who overconsume alcohol can end up with another ALD known as alcoholic hepatitis. Now, alcoholic hepatitis is actually going to have a lot of signs and symptoms from somebody that has viral hepatitis. So you can see people that are jaundiced, that they have a swollen and large liver, that it can be very painful, um, and they can feel ill in general. And the reason why is their liver is not functioning the way that it should. Uh, essentially, what's happening is, is they're consuming so much alcohol, and the processes of clearing that alcohol is leading to damage within the liver, and this is going to lead to inflammation. So as the tissue begins to get damaged, one of the ways the body one of the, the tools your body utilizes to help repair damaged tissue is known as the inflammatory response. The inflammatory response, um, you probably notice whenever you get a cut or a scrape or perhaps when you're ill, is where the blood is essentially rushed to areas um, where things are damaged because the blood contains a lot of the, the, the blood products that you need in order to repair damaged tissue. This particular swelling and inflammation of the liver due to the damage caused by the alcohol is going to decrease liver function and is going to give the appearance of somebody that has a damaged liver because that's exactly what's going on. Now, like we saw with fatty liver disease, not everybody who abuses alcohol um, on a regular basis is going to develop alcoholic hepatitis. And like we saw with fatty liver disease, although that alcoholic hepatitis is more severe than fatty liver disease, it can also typically clear up on its own so long as somebody stops the overconsumption of alcohol. In fact, they should probably stop drinking altogether at that point because they've severely damaged the liver. However, the most severe of the ALDs um, can be escalated from alcoholic hepatitis, and this is known as cirrhosis. Cirrhosis of the liver is when the liver has become so damaged that there are parts of the liver that have now ceased to function. Um, essentially what happens is blood pathways become occluded by the inflammatory response or by the amount of scar tissue that's forming due to the liver damage. The problem with that is now the liver is able to, the liver is continuing to accumulate those toxins, but it's unable to actually detoxify them and remove them from your body. As a result, these things are now hanging around in your body and the liver is essentially dying because it's unable to clear itself of these, um, of these toxins. Now, unlike the previous two ALDs, cirrhosis is technically not reversible. Whatever damage is done is usually permanent damage at that point. However, with, the inter with medical intervention to help treat um, the symptoms of cirrhosis and the cess cessation of consuming alcohol, cirrhosis doesn't have to be a fatal condition. Overwhelmingly, when it comes to cases of alcoholic liver diseases, when they progress to the point of uh, becoming potentially fatal, it's usually because someone is unable to stop consuming alcohol, or they've consumed alcohol to the point that the liver is so damaged that it actually can't be uh, treated or repaired in any, in, in any reasonable manner. Along the lines of, uh, of more chronic effects that actually happen that don't necessarily devolve the involve the liver directly um, is the fact that overconsumption of alcohol, as I mentioned before, can lead to the mobilization of those fat stores. Over time, those triglycerides are actually going to be released by the liver into circulation, and they typically get released in the form of uh, VLDL, so very low-density lipoproteins. And in the blood, they were actually degrade into LDLs, so you probably remember low-density lipoproteins or LDLs as bad cholesterol. So why is this a major issue, right? The liver is actually clearing out um, some of those lipids, which should be decreasing um, the fattiness of the fatty liver, right? Well, here's the downside. You are now increasing your circulating cholesterol in the form of LDLs, and over time, this cholesterol can sort of break away from those LDLs, fall in suspension, and contribute to atherosclerosis. So what's interesting is, although alcohol typically contains no cholesterol whatsoever, it can actually be harmful to your blood cholesterol levels simply because it mobilizes those fat stores leading to the production and accumulation of LDLs in the bloodstream. So we've talked at significant length about the negative effects of alcohol. And to be fair, there are a significant number of them, but typically those are related to the overconsumption of alcohol. As I said, it's perfectly acceptable to typically consume um, between one and two drinks on a daily basis. And actually, uh, there are some scientific studies that show that the moderate consumption of alcohol can be beneficial. 
First, there have been several studies out there that suggest that people who consume uh, that consume um, low amounts of alcohol on a regular basis are have significantly lowered risk of developing heart disease and other cardiovascular problems. There also seems to be some evidence that they're less uh, at risk of developing metabolic disorders and type 2 diabetes as well. Add to it the fact that the, that, that the consumption of alcohol not in excess can also help your mental health as well. So for example, it can actually act as a source of comfort or relaxation for people um, when, when they're in periods of stress. It can also, has also been shown to be effective as a digestive aid. So overall, the consumption of alcohol in moderation doesn't seem to be problematic. In fact, the moderate consumption of alcohol may be quite beneficial to, to the people who consume it. On the other hand, the excessive, con the excessive consumption of alcohol can be highly problematic, especially when that overconsumption occurs over very long periods of time. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, today we talked all about alcohol. We talked about uh, the positive effects and predominantly the negative effects of the overconsumption of alcohol. And we talked about how your body attempts to process and detoxify the ethanol that you consume. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you learned a lot today and I look forward to seeing you at some of my other videos. Bye.